Zhang Jin. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, oh. <laughs> I copy arrived today. Today in the mail. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> uh, thank you thank you very much and congratulations <laughs> thank you uh, uh i worked very hard <laughs> for this book for my book what's that Oh, hello. Yes. It's been nice to meet you again. Yes. Online. Yeah. It's all fine to talk through online with you. What? It's a, the it's a first time to talk with you online. Yes. So, oh, yeah, we met. I think you visited the, the last time you visited Korea. Is two, two thousand eighteen, already three years. You right. visited, yeah, uh, right. so my university is uh, two thousand eighteen. Right. The, and, the uh, yeah, yeah. After and after the conference, better. after the conference in Tokyo, yeah. uh, the two hundredth anniversary. Yeah. I, yes. Uh, uh, so you must be very busy these days. So uh, yes, uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, because of due to this project, yeah, I became yeah. a kind of a, a bureaucrat, a research a bureaucrat, bureaucrat <laughs> rather than a. <laughs> Yeah, I'm very sorry that uh, I must concentrate on my research, but related to, to several things, I have to take that job. <laughs> uh, but uh, I yes. Think, uh, yeah. And this is uh, uh, the morning time in East Asia. So it's a morning. It's, uh, usually the researchers or activists, uh, they, their, uh, their time is uh, afternoon and right. evening. So, right. so morning time uh, is not good for audience. So I will appreciate right. you right. to right. Is, uh, uh, understand that audience will not be so large. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah. But uh, I did, and so Gino did circulate uh, as widely as possible. So we sent the use list of the as many as either all the related uh, aspects. Uh, yes, some people will cut uh, this time. Uh -huh. I, can't, I can't hear you very well. It's choppy, choppy, you know. I mean, it's not, it's oh. not your English. It's just the audio. Uh, can, you hear, can you hear me OK? <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, oh, yes, very well. Um, good. Uh, can I start? Can you what? Hmm? Son, uh, Son, Son Jin, uh, can I start? <laughs> hmm? Stop. <laughs> hmm? Okay, now time is okay. 10 a.m. here. Okay. Uh, let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. 
I think it's time uh, to begin. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to attend today's online talk. I'm Ryuji Sasaki from Rikkyo University, uh, Tokyo, and I'm going to be the moderator and the discussant of the talk today by Professor Fred Mosley, titled The Circuit of Money Capital and the End of the Transformation Program. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Professor Fred Mosley. Uh, as many of you already know, Fred Mosley is one of the world's uh, foremost scholars of Marx and his critique uh, of political economy. He is a professor of economics at Mount Holyoke College and known in particular for theoretical works concerning the logical method employed by Marx in Capital and the theory of the distribution of surplus value in Volume 3 of Capital. Uh, one of his key works in the book is the book uh, Money and Totality, a macro-monetary interpretation of Marx's logic in capital and the end of the transformation problem, which was published in 2016. In this book, he provides a very logical and coherent inter interpretation of Marx's capital as a whole, thereby uh, presenting an interesting solution of the so-called transformation problem. Uh, since meeting Fred at a symposium held in Tokyo in 2018, I have been able to discuss various ideas with him through email and I have learned a, a lot from his insights. And I'm looking forward to again benefiting uh, from his knowledge today. Uh, before uh, he begins, let me just say a brief word about the schedule. Uh, Professor uh, Mosley will make a presentation for uh, around 40 minutes, followed by 20 minutes for my comments and questions at, uh, as the discussant, and uh, for Fred's response to my questions, and then a final 20 minutes for questions and comments uh, from the floor. Uh, so, so uh, uh, I'd like to ask Professor uh, Mosley to begin. Please start. Okay, thank you very much, Yuji. Uh, uh, I would also like to say that uh, I have enjoyed very much our email correspondence uh, and have also learned a great deal uh, uh, as a result. So. Uh, it is definitely uh, mutually mutually uh, beneficial. Thank you, uh, and and thank you to uh, Song Jin and others who have organized uh, 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 this this symposium. Um, I, uh, uh, I I'd rather be in Seoul, uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, it's it's at least this is a, a good uh, second second uh, possibility. Okay, so my paper is 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 basically uh, an introduction to my book, uh, uh, which is as the title suggests a, a reexamination of the overall logical method uh, employed by Marx in Capital. Uh, especially as related to the long-standing controversy uh, over the so-called transformation problem, uh, according to which uh, Marx's theory of prices of production uh, in volume three of Capital is alleged to be logically inconsistent uh, with, with his theory of value and surplus value in volume one. Uh, this criticism has been the main reason for rejecting Marx's theory over the last century. Uh, my book argues that if Marx's overall logical method is correctly understood, uh, then Marx's theory of prices of production in volume three is uh, logically consistent with the theory of value and surplus value in volume one. And uh, there is no, in fact, transformation problem in Marx's theory. 
Uh, and the book argues that there are two main aspects, as the title suggests, uh, of Marx's logical method that are especially relevant to the transformation problem. Uh, and I characterize these two aspects in modern economic terms as macroeconomic and monetary. Uh, I argue that uh, volume one is primarily uh, a macroeconomic theory. It's mainly about the total surplus value uh, produced in the economy as a whole. And also that volume one is primarily a monetary theory. Uh, the main variables that are determined in volume one are monetary variables. And especially uh, the total surplus value that's determined in volume one is a monetary value. Uh, Delta M uh, in Marx, uh, Marx's striking uh, abbreviation to focus attention on this most important characteristic of capitalist economy. So I want to uh, briefly discuss uh, each of these two, the macro and then the monetary aspect of my interpretation of uh, Marx's logical method in capital. So first, the macro. Uh, I argue uh, uh, that there are two main levels of abstraction in Marxist theory. Uh, the production of surplus value in volumes one and two, uh, which is about the determination of the total surplus value produced in the economy as a whole. And then second level of abstraction is the distribution of surplus value uh, in volume three, which is about the division of the predetermined total surplus value into individual parts. First, the equalization of profit rates across industries, and then the further division of the total surplus value into commercial profit, uh, interest, and rent. And the key point about this logical method is that the production of surplus value is theorized, explained prior to the distribution of surplus value. There is a logical sequence. Uh, the, the total amount of surplus value uh, is theoretically determined logically prior to the division of this total surplus value into individual parts. The total surplus value is determined uh, in the first level of abstraction, uh, the, the production of surplus value, and then this total surplus value is presupposed uh, in the second level of abstraction, the distribution of surplus value. And I argue that this logical progression uh, from the total to the individual parts of surplus value follows directly from Marx's labor theory of value and surplus value. Uh, according to Marx's theory, all the individual parts of surplus value come from the same source, which is the surplus labor of production workers. Therefore, the total surplus value must be determined first by surplus labor. And then this total surplus value is divided into the individual parts, which also depend on other, other factors, uh, including especially the equalization of the profit rate. Okay, so Marx referred to these two levels of abstraction uh, in Hegelian terms, quasi. Hegelian terms as capital in general, uh, uh, which is about the production of surplus value and the competition uh, of many capitals, uh, which is about the distribution of surplus value. I argued in a recent paper that this aspect of Marx's logical method was patterned after Hegel's logic and especially Hegel's concepts of universality and particularity. So Marx's capital in general corresponds to Hegel's universality and Hegel's particularity corresponds to Marx's mini cap. The transformation problem is usually uh, interpreted as a transformation between two micro, two sets of micro economic variables uh, from uh, the uh, individual labor values in volume one to individual prices of production in volume three. But I argue that this is not what Marx's transformation is about. Marx's transformation is from macro variables to uh, micro variables, from the total price and the total surplus value to individual prices and the individual parts of 
surplus value. Uh, and the, the, the standard interpretation of Marx's theory uh, misses entirely uh, the all important prior macro aspect of Marx's theory uh, and the determination of the total surplus value prior to its distribution. I would say that the transformation problem is really more like a disaggregation problem, not a transformation from individual values to individual prices. My voice is not what it used to be, so I have to keep uh, lubricating. Uh, I think the textual evidence to support this macro aspect of Marx's logical method is very strong, and I would say conclusive. Uh, this point is repeated many times uh, in all the drafts of Capital, as I've shown uh, in chapter three of my book. Um, uh, the strongest evidence of the prior determination of the total surplus value is actually volume three of Capital, because throughout volume three, the total surplus value is presupposed. Right? Uh, in the theory of prices of production, in the theory of commercial profit, interest and rent, the total surplus value is presupposed as already determined in the prior in, in uh, uh, macro theory of volume one. So chapter three of my book uh, is a comprehensive examination of all this textual evidence. Um, and, and just let me mention that other authors who have uh, emphasized this macro aspect of Marx's logical method uh, include Paul Maddock, Sr., uh, Rostovsky, and, and Duncan Foley have been influences on me. Maddock, I would say, was the main influence on my thing. Uh, to clear up one point, uh, Marx's basic theory of surplus value in volume one is uh, often illustrated by uh, a single capital and a, a single worker. Uh, and in the, the key basic theory of surplus value in uh, chapter seven in the English edition, I think it's uh, uh, chapter five in uh, uh, some of the Asian editions, uh, uh, the, the illustration is in terms of a spinner of yarn, making yarn. Uh, but obviously Marx's theory of surplus value is not about one yarn spinner. Rather, uh, the yarn spinner represents the working class as a whole. Marx's theory in volume one is about what all workers have in common. That's the universality, uh, the production of value and surplus value. So the same theory that's applied to the yarn spinner uh, in volume one applies to each and every worker and thus applies to the total uh, surplus value produced by all workers together. Uh, so this is also uh, a feature uh, that uh, Marx borrowed from Hegel. Uh, Mar uh, Hegel also uh, often used a, a typical individual as representative of the universal. Uh, Hegel's logic starts with the universal and then analyzes the individual as a representative of the universal. And, and Marx uses the yarn spinner in order to explain how all workers uh, produce value and surplus value. Mikhail Heinrich has argued, uh, including in his lecture earlier in this series, uh, that Marx abandoned the logical structure of capital in general and competition while working on the manuscript of 1861-63. Uh, however, uh, Heinrich has also acknowledged in a paper and in discussions that Marx maintained the logical structure of the production and distribution of surplus value. So he argues that there's really two logical structures going on, capital in general and competition and the production and and, and, and distribution of surplus value, and Marx maintained the production and distribution of surplus value, but not capital in general uh, and, and competition. This doesn't make any sense to me uh, that there could be two overall uh, logical structures uh, in, 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 in capital. Uh, uh, in, in my view, uh, 
the logical structure of the production and distribution of surplus value uh, is the quantitative dimension of the more general logical structure of capital in general and competition. But it's the same, it's the same logical structure, production and distribution of surplus value focuses on the quantitative dimension. The main quantitative question at the level of abstraction of capital in general is the production of surplus value. And the main quantitative question at the level of abstraction of competition is the distribution of surplus value. So uh, uh, it doesn't make any sense that there would be two uh, uh, overarching uh, logical structures in capital existing side by side, such that capital in general is supposed to include all of the production of surplus value, but also include some elements of the distribution of surplus value. Uh, and so, according to Mikhail, uh, the capital in general and uh, competition has to be abandoned. But uh, even if Heinrich wants to insist that there are these two logical structures in capital, I am at least glad he accepts that Marx maintained the logical structure of the production and distribution of surplus value, uh, because that logical structure is what I'm most concerned about and what matters most for the transformation problem. The prior determination of the total surplus value are presupposed uh, in the determination of prices of production. A, a related aspect of uh, Marx's uh, logical method, which follows from the two levels of abstraction, uh, is that Marx's theory in all three volumes of capital is about uh, a single system. Uh, and this single system is the actual capitalist economy, which is theorized uh, first at the macro level, the total surplus value, and then subsequently theorized at the micro level of the individual parts. Uh, therefore, the total surplus value that is determined in volume one and two is the actual total surplus value produced in the actual capitalist economy as a whole. It's not a hypothetical total surplus value, which is assumed to be proportional to the labor value of surplus goods and which would later have to be transformed uh, into the actual total profit in volume three, uh, which would depend on other factors. Uh, I argue Marx's theory is about the actual total surplus value from the beginning uh, in volume one. Uh, by contrast, Marx's theory is often interpreted to be about two different economic systems, right? The so-called dual uh, interpretation, dual system interpretation. First, a hypothetical value system in volumes one and two, uh, in which commodities are assumed to exchange at their values. And then uh, finally, uh, in volume three, the actual capitalist price system in which commodities uh, exchange at their prices of production. But I argue uh, Marxist theory is not based on this dual system type of structure, but uh, is about the same economic system from beginning to end. Uh, the, the actual capitalist economy uh, in all three volumes of capital. So that's the macro aspect. And, and then to uh, continue uh, uh, with the, the, the monetary aspect of Marx's logical method. And it seems to me that even many critics of Marx's theory uh, acknowledged that Marx attempted to determine the total surplus value prior to its distribution, more or less as described above. However, uh, these critics argue that Marx was not able to successfully implement uh, this logical method in his theory of prices of production uh, in volume three because the inputs of constant capital and variable capital have to be transformed in volume three from values to prices of production. And when C and V, constant capital and variable capital are transformed, then the total surplus value also changes and the rate of profit also changes. And so these profit variables cannot be presupposed uh, in volume three because they uh, change or transform uh, from values to prices of production, supposedly uh, in volume three. That's, that's the so-called transformation problem. Marx failed to transform the inputs and therefore this 
uh, method of the prior determination of the total surplus value doesn't work. I argue that these critics are wrong, right? And my main argument has to do with the monetary aspect of my interpretation, and in particular with the circuit of money capital, which I argue is the overall logical framework of Marx's theory of the production and distribution of surplus value in all three volumes of capital. The circuit of money capital uh, is expressed symbolically by the well-known formula, you're all familiar, M, C, dot, 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 uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end, M plus the all important Delta M, right? And so the circuit of money capital is especially relevant to this widely accepted criticism of the transformation problem that Marx failed to transform the inputs because the inputs that the critics argue Marx failed to transform are the quantities of money capital M at the beginning of the circuit of money capital. So the circuit of money capital uh, expresses the most important feature of capitalist economies, money making more money, uh, and focuses Marx's theory on the most important question in any theory of capitalism, and especially in Marx's theory, where does the delta M come from? And what determines uh, its magnitude, the magnitude, quantity of delta M? The circuit of money capital is not just an illustration in chapter four that plays no significant role in the rest of Marxist theory. Uh, uh, instead, the circuit of money capital is the basic logical framework for all of Marxist theory in all three volumes of capital. Uh, and again, the standard interpretation uh, generally misses uh, the importance of the circuit of money capital as the basic logical framework of Marxist theory. Uh, another common misinterpretation of Marxist theory uh, of volume one is that volume one is only about quantities of labor times, right? And money and prices are introduced and explained only in volume three. Right? Uh, even constant capital and variable capital are often defined in units of labor time, right? in spite of the general definition of capital as money, as money that is advanced in order to make more money. Uh, well, I argue that this common view uh, of volume one is, is a fundamental misinterpretation, which loses sight of the essential monetary nature of capitalism uh, and of Marxist theory. Of capitalism. Money is derived by Marx uh, in the very first chapter uh, of volume one in the notorious section three uh, as the necessary form of appearance of social labor uh, in capitalism. And then from that point on, section three of chapter one, uh, 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 Marx's theory is about quantities of money that represent and therefore are determined by quantities of labor time. The title of part one, I remind you, is Commodities and Money, right? And the title of part two is The Transformation of Money into Capital. So volume one is not just about labor times, uh, but labor times that determine prices and quantities of money, and above all, labor times, surplus labor that determines uh, the delta M, the, the labor time that explains how money is transformed into capital. I don't see how uh, volume one could be interpreted as only about uh, labor times. Uh, and also uh, Marx's theory of prices of production uh, in part two uh, of volume three is also analyzed implicitly in terms of the circuit of money capital disaggregated into individual industries. The question that Marx's theory of prices of production is intended, is intended to answer is this. How is the money capital that is advanced in each industry at the beginning of the circuit of money capital, uh, we could call it M with a subscript I, uh, this money capital advanced in, in each industry, how is this advanced money capital recovered together with the average profit? That's, that's the question that's, that the theory of prices of production answers. So uh, in contrast, Srafa's logical method is very different 
course, uh, from Marx's circuit of money capital. Sraffa's logical framework is in physical terms, right? The matrix of uh, input output coefficients and the labor coefficient vector. Uh, the beginning of Sraffa's theory is not an advance of money capital, but is instead given physical quantities of inputs which firms somehow are in possession of uh, and whose prices have not yet been determined. Uh, so to, to me, the most striking feature and the most disappointing feature of Sraffa's theory is the complete uh, absence of money, uh, especially the absence of the all important delta M, uh, uh, the most important feature of capitalist economies. How can, how can this be an adequate theory of capitalism without money? Uh, uh, in in Sraffian theory, the, the first phase of the circulation of money capital in the sphere of circulation, the, the advance of money capital to purchase the inputs is ignored, right? And, and it is as if no money capital is advanced to purchase the inputs. But this is obviously not true. Money capital is advanced in capitalism in definite quantities. And these quantities of money capital must be recovered before there can be any increment of money, any delta M. So I argue that the currently popular Sraffian interpretation of Marx's theory in terms of uh, input output uh, uh, method is a fundamental misinterpretation of Marx's theory of the circuit of money capital. And it's important to recognize that, that the circuit of money capital is a process uh, in real historical times, money is advanced and then there's production and then commodities are sold and money is recovered, right? Uh, so the, the real process begins in the sphere of circulation uh, with the advance of money capital uh, and then continues uh, 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 into the sphere of production where commodities are, are produced and then finally return to the sphere of circulation where the commodities are sold and a greater quantity of money capital is recovered. Uh, and, and the initial money capital uh, that's advanced uh, 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 must be recovered before there can be any uh, uh, surplus value, any profit. Uh, so uh, the, the initial uh, money capital is not an unknown in Marxist theory uh, and in reality. Uh, the uh, initial money capital uh, is, is, is exists at the beginning of the circuit, uh, beginning of the process, and this previously existing money uh, is taken as given uh, in Marx's theory of how this money becomes more money at the end of the process. And the crucial point for the transformation problem is that Marx's theory of prices of production in, in volume three, the same quantities of money capital, money constant capital and money variable capital are taken as given uh, in volume three as in the volume one theory of the total surplus value. And the same quantities are the actual quantities of money capital advanced to purchase means of production and labor power at the beginning of the circuit of money capital. The only difference between volume one and volume three in this regard is the level of aggregation. Uh, in volume three, the individual quantities of constant capital and variable capital advanced in each industry are also taken as given in addition to the total constant capital and variable capital that are taken as given in the macro theory in volume one. So as I mentioned before, the question that Marx's theory of prices of production is intended to answer is how is this actual money capital that's advanced in each industry, how is it recovered together with an average share of the total surplus value according to the capital advanced in each industry? That's the question. And for this question, the appropriate initial givens are the actual initial quantities of money capital advanced and consumed in each industry, the, the M uh, sub I's. Uh, the, the, the money capital advanced uh, has to be recovered uh, before any profit can be appropriated. So that's why I conclude 
uh, in, 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 in a nutshell, so to speak, in brief, uh, that Marx did not fail to transform the inputs of constant capital and variable capital, as is commonly alleged, uh, because no such transformation of the inputs is necessary or appropriate uh, in Marxist theory. The inputs of constant capital and variable capital uh, in Marx's theory of prices of production in volume three are supposed to be the same actual quantities of money capital advanced and consumed uh, in the actual capitalist economy that are the inputs in Marx's macro theory of the total surplus value uh, uh, in volume one. And now the textual evidence uh, to support this monetary aspect uh, of my interpretation of Marx's theory, uh, that the same actual quantities of initial constant capital and variable capital are taken as given at both levels of abstraction uh, is not as clear cut and conclusive uh, as for the macro uh, aspect. The determination of constant capital and variable capital is somewhat complicated because of the two levels of abstraction uh, in Marx's theory. Uh, uh, constant capital and variable capital are equal to prices of production, but prices of production cannot be explained uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the macro theory of uh, volume one. So the explanation, the eventual explanation of constant capital and variable capital uh, is more complicated. Uh, and unfortunately in the published editions of volume one, uh, Marx tried to simplify and, 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 and uh, finesse this complication uh, in order to make his theory more accessible and at the constant urging of Engels, which uh, I think was a mistake from a scholarly point of view uh, and has left a legacy of ambiguity in some of the crucial texts uh, and uh, misunderstanding in my view. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I, there is substantial evidence to support uh, this monetary interpretation of the initial givens uh, in Marx's theory, uh, especially in the early drafts of capital uh, uh, before the simplifications. And chapter four of my book presents 100 pages uh, of this textual evidence from all the drafts of capital to support uh, this monetary interpretation of the initial givens. And the strongest evidence to support this interpretation is the circuit of money capital itself right? that begins in the sphere of circulation with the advance of money capital uh, to purchase the inputs. Uh, and this beginning of the circulation of money capital is the beginning of Marxist theory, is the starting point, the initial data uh, in Marx's theory of how this initial given pre-existing quantity of money capital becomes more money through the production and sale of commodities. Now, uh, the final aspect, or one more aspect to, to mention uh, of uh, Marx's logical method uh, uh, is that uh, Marx's theory is based on the logic of sequential determination. Uh, of the key variables, not simultaneous determination as in Sraffian theory and the Sraffian interpretation of Marx's theory. Uh, sequential determination follows from the two main aspects, completely consistent with the two main aspects of Marx's method discussed, just discussed, right? One, the total surplus value is determined logically prior. And there's a logical sequence to its division into individual parts. And the total surplus value is then presupposed uh, in the determination of the individual parts. And secondly, the circuit of money capital uh, is a process in real time and the initial money capital exists at the beginning of the circuit and is taken as given, uh, uh, again, uh, a sequential logic from the inputs to the outputs uh, in the circuit of money capital. So, the logic of simultaneous determination of all the variables, uh, the inputs and the outputs, and the, uh, well, the, the total surplus value is generally ignored, but the simultaneous determination is not appropriate for Marx's theory uh, of the, uh, 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 for both of these reasons, right? 
uh, simu simultaneous determination that it does not allow for the prior determination of the total surplus value, and also does not allow for taking a pre-existing money capital uh, as given uh, in the beginning of the circuit in order to determine and explain the uh, increment uh, M prime and delta M at the end of the circuit. And we do it time-wise. I have a few more minutes, huh? Let me take the, the last minute. I have this uh, few minutes uh, to just uh, briefly compare uh, my macro monetary interpretation uh, with two other uh, important uh, reinterpretations of Marxist theory uh, in recent decades, which you're all familiar with, uh, the new interpretation uh, and the temporal uh, single system interpretation. Uh, so first with the new interpretation, uh, I argue that uh, the new interpretation goes only halfway in breaking away from the standard interpretation of Marxist theory. Uh, the, the new interpret, uh, one similarity is the new interpretation uh, 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 assumes that volume one is mainly a macro theory about the total surplus value. Uh, uh, completely agree. However, uh, the new interpretation does not presuppose the total surplus value uh, that's determined in volume one, does not presuppose this amount in the theory of uh, the rate of profit and prices of production in volume three. It, it, it just ignores the total surplus value that it puts primary emphasis on uh, in its interpretation of volume one. Okay, so that's one way in which the new interpretation only goes halfway. Uh, the, uh, another similarity with my interpretation is the new interpretation takes variable capital or what do you call it, the money wage uh, is taken as given uh, in the determination of both values and prices of production. And most importantly, the same quantity of variable capital is taken as given at, at, at both levels of abstraction. The, the money wage is invariant as it's described, right? Similar to my interpretation. However, uh, the new interpretation does not take the money constant capital as given. Instead, the new interpretation derives constant capital from the given physical quantities of means of production and so constant capital uh, uh, changes uh, from uh, values to prices of production. Uh, and this, I think, is the major uh, flaw uh, in the, the, the new interpretation. So, and, and I argue that, th that there is a fundamental inconsistency uh, in the new interpretation. Constant capital and variable capital are determined in two different ways. Uh, but constant capital and variable capital are the two components of M, right? Of the initial money capital advanced at the beginning of the circuit of money capital. So these two components of the initial money capital should be determined in the same way. Uh, and so this is uh, the, the fundamental problem uh, in the new interpretation in my view. Uh, and because constant capital changes in the transformation, the price rate of profit is not equal to the value rate of profit, uh, and the total price of production is not equal to the total value. So you get these uh, uh, results that are uh, damaging uh, uh, to Marxist theory. So I consider what I do as basically an extension of the new interpretation uh, to make it logically consistent and to eliminate the transformation problem altogether to take constant capital uh, uh, as well as variable capital as given and to determine the rate of profit from the predetermined total surplus value. And then the price rate of profit is equal to the value rate of profit. The aggregate price equality is satisfied and the alleged transformation problem in Marxist theory is eliminated. If the, if the new interpretation would only take money constant capital as given, like it does money variable capital, I think all its problems would be solved. Finally, the TSSI uh, you're familiar with is, is it interprets the transformation 
uh, from values to prices of production as a multi-period transformation process, not all in one period. Uh, in uh, Kleinman and McClone's original paper in 1988, there were 13 periods, starting with values and then a succession of iterations. Uh, eventually, uh, the uh, long run equilibrium uh, prices of production. Now, what's, what's interesting and important, I think, is that within each period, each of these iterations, uh, uh, the TSSI uh, and my interpretation are very similar. Right? Uh, in the important sense is that the total surplus value and the rate of profit are determined prior to prices of production in that period. Uh, and C and constant capital and variable capital are taken as given uh, and the same quantities uh, of C and V are taken as given uh, at both levels of abstraction within this one period. However, the main difference between the TSSI and my interpretation is that the, the TSSI uh, prices of production are short run equilibria prices in the sense that they change uh, every period, period after period, even though uh, nothing else changes. And especially even though the productivity of labor uh, remains constant. Uh, and the, the TSSI prices continue to change period after period until they eventually converge to the long run equilibrium prices that are in fact the same as the Bortkowitz Sweezy prices of production. On the other hand, I argue that Marx's prices of production are long run equilibrium prices uh, in the sense that they change only if the productivity of labor changes. Uh, uh, and I argue that there is uh, substantial textual evidence to support my interpretation that Marx's prices of production uh, are long run equilibrium prices that change only if the productivity of labor changes. Uh, and I cited in my paper, my seminar paper, uh, an earlier online paper uh, 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 in which I presented uh, this textual evidence and uh, uh, I would be happy uh, to discuss. Uh, and I imagine that this issue is gonna come up during the discussion anyway. So uh, I think uh, uh, I, I will leave it at that. Uh, and uh, I look forward to the news uh, comments and, and to further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank so you what happens next? Thank you very much uh, for a very in interesting and uh, insightful presentation. Uh, next, I'd like to make a few comments and the questions. Uh, I I will share my PowerPoint. Uh, first, I'm talking about uh, Mosley's book, uh, The uh, Important Contributions to Marxian Economics. Uh, I think, uh, uh, especially uh, the uh, first point and the fourth point uh, are very uh, important. Uh, I, I learned uh, uh, a lot from uh, Mosley's book, uh, 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 especially regarding uh, single system interpretation and the textual evidences. And uh, about uh, the fourth point, uh, in Japan, especially, uh, the fourth point is uh, important uh, because uh, in Japan, uh, most of Marxian economists uh, uh, don't know uh, the recent works of Western Marxist scholars on uh, the so-called transformation problem. 
And next, uh, I'm talking about uh, quest my questions. Uh, my question is the following. Uh, I uh, discussed uh, these points in time. Uh, my first question is about a relation uh, capital volume one and volume three. Uh, I think uh, Mosley's interpretation uh, focuses on the qualitative determination. Uh, according to his interpretation, uh, volume one is about uh, capital in general and uh, deals deal, deal with uh, macroeconomy and uh, discusses uh, production of the total surplus value. Uh, while uh, volume three is about uh, competition of many capitals and uh, deals with uh, microeconomy and discusses uh, distribution of the total surplus value into individual, individual parts. Uh, I think, uh, uh, however, I think uh, that in, uh, in order to uh, uh, understand uh, Marx's, Marx's capital correctly, uh, we, we should focus it uh, on not only the quantitative determination, but also uh, the qualitative determination. Uh, therefore, uh, my interpretation focuses on the qualitative determination. Uh, in my opinion, uh, volume one is about uh, economic determination of how concerning essential mechanism of capitalism and distribution of total social labor are supplied by private producers through the market and discusses a production with the surplus body of wage labor. And uh, uh, in, in my opinion, volume three is uh, about uh, economic determination of home uh, concerning a phenomenal mechanism of capitalism and uh, distribution of the total surplus body supplied capital through the market and discusses appropriation of surplus value in various forms by capital. Anyway, uh, uh, according to uh, Mosley's interpretation, uh, first uh, volume, volume one is about uh, capital in general, volume three is uh, competition of many capitals. However, uh, I think uh, there are many descriptions uh, in capital uh, that uh, which contract the contract uh, Mosley's interpretation. Uh, for example, uh, there are many descri description, descriptions about competition in volume one, while the title of book three, uh, book three uh, here means uh, volume three in Engels edition. Uh, uh, the title of book three is about uh, Holmes, uh, the process as a whole, and uh, uh, not a uh, competition of, of many uh, capitals, etc. Uh, further, uh, Marx wrote to Kugelman in March 1868 uh, in volume two, uh, volume two uh, here means. Uh, volume two and three in Engels edition. Uh, in volume two, uh, property in land will be one of the subjects analyzed competition only in so far as called for in the treatment as a themes. Uh, it is, I think it is clear from this citation that uh, the subject of uh, uh, volume three is not uh, about competition. Uh, moreover, uh, uh, the transla translation of the sentence of manuscript of 1864 to 65, quoted in page 84 of uh, Mosley's book, is uh, incorrect, I think. Uh, the phrase translated uh, uh, 
ads mm. uh, when looked at to capital in general should be translated uh, as uh, when we consider capital generally uh, because uh, the original sentence in German is by the Argemeine Betrachtung des Kapitals. Uh, uh, the uh, literal uh, translation of this uh, phrase is uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the in the general consideration of capital. Uh, anyway, even from these points alone, Mosley's interpretation of the uh, of the relation or, or relation between volume one and three seems to be not valid. Uh, this is the first point that uh, I'd uh, I'd <clears throat> I'd like to ask Fred. Uh, the, uh, my second uh, question is about long run equilibrium. equilibrium. Uh, in Mosley's interpretation, the prices of production are the, are the long run equilibrium prices. Therefore, in equilibrium state, input price should be equal to output price and not uh, be historical cost as TSSI. On the other hand, his interpretation argues that Marx theory is based on the logic of a sequential determination of the key variables. These two arguments seems to contradict each other uh, for me. And, uh, the, uh, this is the uh, uh, second point uh, that I'd like to uh, ask uh, Fred. Uh, my uh, third question is about the distribution of social, social total labor. Uh, Mosley's book discusses uh, aggregate quantities between value and production price or between surplus value and average profit. Uh, uh, but uh, it, uh, does, it doesn't uh, discuss the regulation prices by the distribution of social total labor. However, uh, I think we cannot understand Marx's theory of value without considering this point. Uh, for example, uh, Marx wrote in Capital Volume 1, uh, in this citation, uh, uh, the most important thing uh, is, in, uh, is uh, marked in debt. Uh, all the relations or between Robinson and these objects that form his self-created values are here so simple and transparent. And yet uh, those relations contain all the, the essential determinants of value. Uh, this is a, a sad, the, uh, this is a sad point uh, that I'd like to ask uh, Fred. Uh, that is all from me. Uh, so uh, I'd like to ask Fred to reply uh, to my questions, uh, please. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you very much, Yuji. Uh, I mean, I really appreciate uh, the substantial comments. Uh, which, by the way, I received uh, by email this morning, uh, so I've had some time to think about it. Uh, I appreciate that too. Uh, as as Nuji said, uh, uh, we have been corresponding off and on for a couple of years, uh, and more frequently uh, in recent weeks in preparation for uh, this symposium, and I have found these discussions to be very useful and productive. And, uh, and this is uh, true uh, tonight as well. And I guess I would also especially uh, appreciate the fact that you are commenting here uh, in a second language, you know, and maybe a third language, I don't know. But uh, uh, I, I have a little experience with that and I know how difficult and challenging that is. And so I, I appreciate that. Um, first of all, thank you very much for listing uh, 
the uh, very important contributions of my book. I mean, I think these are this the four that you mentioned are what I was trying to contribute, right? The, uh, the uh, single system and the textual evidence and the uh, price of production as the distribution of surplus value, the monetary aspect, uh, and the review of the Marxian scholarship in recent decades. Uh, that's what I was trying to do. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate you uh, pointing that out. And your questions are also good ones. Uh, and uh, I will uh, respond briefly. Uh, and I have no doubt that uh, our discussions will go on. Uh, so uh, the first slide uh, about the relationship between volume one and volume three, Nuji uh, argues my interpretation focuses on quantitative issues and his interpretation focuses on qualitative issues. And it is true uh, that my book is about uh, the transformation problem, right? And, and the transformation problem is primarily a quantitative issue. My book is not a general comprehensive, this is, uh, the three volumes of capital, although it's it, it there's a lot of that, but it, it really is focused on the transformation problem, right? And and so that is uh, a quantitative issue, uh, and uh, you seem uh, to agree, at least to a large extent, uh, with my quantitative interpretation. But uh, I would like to hear more. Uh, about what you agreed with and what you don't agree with. And I've heard some of that and I'm sure I will hear some more, right? But uh, that's uh, a question uh, from me. Uh, I also agree that the qualitative issues that you emphasize are very important, right? I, I, I'm not saying, in particular, I agree that the law of value uh, has to do with the regulation of the distribution of, so, of social labor in a capitalist commodity economy, right? We've talked a little about that uh, uh, the last week. But I would also say that the law of value also has to do with the law of surplus value, right? Uh, and the determination of surplus value by surplus labor in a quantitative sense. So it's not an either or. I think we need to uh, uh, include both the quantitative and the qualitative uh, in a comprehensive uh, understanding of capital. But my book is, is more quantitative, you are right. Uh, and I hope I did that right, and I think I did. Okay. Uh, the second slide on the relation between volume one and volume two, uh, you argue, you, you, you argue against, you criticize my interpretation that volume one uh, is at the level of abstraction of capital in general uh, and volume two, uh, competition, a volume uh, 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 three volume uh, competition. Uh, um, but you seem to accept that volume one is about the production of surplus value, right? And volume three is about the distribution of surplus value, right? Your argument is with capital in general and competition, uh, it, it, it seemed like. Uh, and, and this is similar to Heinrich. Right, and, and Heinrich's criticism that I discussed uh, in my presentation. Uh, uh, and to me, the logical structure of the production and distribution of surplus value is the most important issue, okay? Uh, I, I think the, the issue of uh, capital in general and competition uh, is more complicated, less clear cut, and that would take a longer discussion. Uh, and I have written a, a, a long paper in response uh, to Heinrich, uh, which I will send you. Uh, but uh, 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 as I said in my presentation, uh, 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 at least Heinrich accepts the uh, distinction between the production and distribution of surplus value. Uh, and to me, uh, that's the most important thing. Also I have one comment on, on, on your point about the title. Uh, of uh, volume three, uh, the forms of the process as a whole. Uh, I would argue that Marx clarified in the first paragraph of the volume what uh, uh, more what this title meant, what he meant by this title, uh, which was 
uh, the concrete forms that grow out of the process, the capitalist process as a whole, right? So the process as a whole has already been presented in, in volumes one and two. Uh, volume one is about the production process. Volume two is about the circulation process, right? So volume three is not a repeat of those earlier volumes of the process as a whole, but is instead the further in investigation of the concrete particular forms that grow out of the process as a whole, right? And we know from the contents of volume three what these concrete forms are, right? They're profit, average profit, commercial profit, interest, rent, revenue, right? These are the, the, the particular forms of the distribution of surplus value, right? So th this is not the process, this is not the total surplus value. That's already been done, right? This is the, the particular parts into which the whole uh, can be divided, are divided, right? In, in, in Hegelian terms, uh, the whole before the parts, right? Um, okay, then the next issue you raised uh, is whether uh, prices of production uh, are long-run equilibrium prices or what I would call short-run equilibrium prices. And I would say, uh, we talked about this before, this is the main disagreement. Uh, uh, between us, the exact nature of prices of production, right? Well, we agree that they're both, that, that prices of production are equilibrium prices, right? But we disagree about uh, the short run uh, versus long run. I argue, as I did in the uh, presentation, that uh, prices of production are long run equilibrium prices in the precise sense that they change only if the productivity of labor changes. Right, uh, and I think I have presented substantial textual evidence uh, on numerous occasions to support this interpretation, uh, including uh, in the uh, online article that I uh, uh, mentioned before. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I think there is a lot of textual evidence to support. Uh, this interpretation. And in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you have suggested in uh, email correspondence that you agree that in these passages, that's what Marx is saying, right? That, that uh, uh, prices of production change uh, uh, only if uh, the productivity of labor uh, changes. Uh, but you have argued that Marx was mistaken. Right, that he didn't under, didn't fully realize. Right, I mean, he was he was mistaken about his own prices of production. Uh, that Marx didn't realize that prices of production would continue to change over multiple periods, even if there was no uh, change in productivity as a result of the ongoing equalization of the race rate of profit, uh, because his prices of production are not long run equilibrium prices. I I think your Marx was mistaken, Marx didn't fully aware. I, I think that's very speculative. Uh, and uh, I think based on little or no uh, textual evidence, but I think this is the key issue. Uh, I think that, that uh, we need to discuss further. Uh, you argue that long run equilibrium prices are not compatible with sequential determination, but that's not true, right? Uh, there, there is a way in which, uh, uh, long run equilibrium is consistent with sequential determination. And I, th I think I presented that. The economy is assumed to be in long run equilibrium. And yet the economy is also uh, uh, assumed to go through the process of the circuit of money capital, right? In equilibrium, right? Uh, and so uh, 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 that is consistent with uh, uh, sequential determination. Um, okay, finally, uh, on the issue of the distribution of social labor, uh, I've already said I agree uh, to a large extent with, with the importance uh, uh, of that, that, that the law of value has to do with the regulation of the distribution of social labor. 
right? Uh, uh, it's true, my book does not discuss this point, right? Uh, but again, my book is about the transformation problem, right? Uh, uh, the production surplus value, the determination of prices of production. Uh, so uh, I did not discuss in my book the, the fundamentals of the law of value uh, in part one. Right, and, and, and you're right about that. Uh, uh, my book essentially starts with part two uh, of, of volume one. I wish now, in fact, that I would have included at least a chapter on part one, and, and maybe that would have cleared up uh, some of these misgivings. Uh, uh, but you know, my book was already 400 pages, so uh, I, I that I, I didn't I didn't do that. Uh, if there's ever a second edition, I will. Uh, and, and your comments are helpful uh, uh, in that regard. And right now, as you know, I'm working on a paper on Rubin, right? And on Rubin's interpretation of Marx's theory of value. Uh, and his interpretation is almost entirely about part one. Right? I mean, and that's one of the problems with Rubin is it's so narrow. Right, just part one. But Rubin emphasizes, uh, and I do in my paper, uh, the role of the law of value in the regulation of the distribution of social labor. Right. So uh, you're right about my book, but not about my general point of view. Right. So thanks again for your uh, constructive comments. I look forward to further discussion. Uh, you know, I would say I think we're making progress. Uh, in at least mutual understanding, uh, uh, and and perhaps even maybe a little bit uh, common understanding. So thanks again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your reply. Um, regarding. Uh, 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 your questions. Uh, I I think uh, the uh, uh, the qualitative uh, determination uh, of value or uh, economic determination of harm uh, is uh, uh, very in, important in in order to uh, the uh, nature of equilibrium. Uh, uh, in order to understand the nature of equilibrium in uh, Marx theory. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, 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 Fezer uh, 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 we uh, uh, the difference of how uh, 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 we understand the uh, determination, uh, qualitative determin determination of harm uh, uh, it causes uh, our differences, uh, I think. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, uh, next, uh, next, uh, uh, let's open up to questions and comments uh, from the floor. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, please. Um, may I raise a question? Hasaki-san? Uh, uh, please, uh, Kei Ehara. Uh, thanks, Professor Mosley, and I'm glad to see you online, although. I'm glad to see you too. We've been <laughs> corresponding about the Rubin book. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for uh, my um, dull understanding. <laughs> Sorry for that. But um, I have a question about um, the relationship between um, your sequential determination of um, the value theory and TSSI type of value theory. Um, I still couldn't get uh, the difference between the two. Um, although uh, 
this issue was discussed in Sas Professor Sasaki's um, discussion. Um, I myself actually take a Strachan type of um, value theory. Um, and I, I think um, the problem you raised about the Strachan type of value theory can be summarized in two. Uh, one is that uh, the Strachan type of uh, value theory do not um, consider the monetary aspect. And the second problem is that um, it is simultaneous determination. And I can understand the first one, and I, I also think that is also problematic. And But I couldn't understand the second one because um, you said uh, TSSI is a sequ um, sequential determination, but um, this is not, um, this is different from what you are presenting. So I couldn't understand the relation between the three, the simultaneous determination, the sequential determination you presented, and TSSI version. So um, I would like to know um, how far your sequential determination is from TSSI. Okay, can I respond now? I'd rather respond one by one, if that's okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, I would uh, uh, hope that, uh, uh, suggest that you read uh, chapter nine of my book, okay. right? Uh, which which is about TSSI, right? And, and is about, uh, it's a comparison. I mean, that's that's part two of my book, uh, right? It's to, it's to uh, go through the uh, Sheikh's interpretation, the new interpretation, the TSSSI, the rethinking, you know, to try to get an overview. And, uh, and so there, I don't know, 40 pages, 30 pages on the TSSI. Uh, and so at least that would be uh, helpful, I think, and, and a starting point. But I think just as, as, a, as a first answer, uh, the difference uh, it really uh, is very close to the difference between uh, uh, myself and uh, Dujan. Right, that that, that uh, whether uh, uh, prices of production are short-run equilibrium prices or long-run equilibrium prices, right? That uh, uh, in in that respect, at least, uh, Duji's uh, interpretation is very similar uh, to the TSSI. Uh, the prices of production, uh, because they're short-run, they change every period. Uh, even though there, even if there's no change in the productivity of labor, right? Uh, and and so uh, uh, that I think is really the crux of the difference uh, between myself and and the TSSI and with duty. And uh, so uh, you have a chance to read the book and ha have uh, read this chapter. Read uh, and, and have, so I'd be happy to discuss further. Okay, thanks. I'll read, I read it. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I want to say hello to Hideto. Uh, I, I met in Tokyo two years ago. Oh, Yakai san, please. Hello, Fred. Hi, Hideto. Sorry to call you out. I, I just yeah. uh, Thank you I appreciate I, I appreciate you you uh, being here. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see you again. And uh, thank you for your interesting presentation and uh, your email. And uh, yeah, uh, I would like to say, um, you know, uh, as 
Mr. K. Hara had to say, uh, if I were you, uh, I would like to mention historical cost in order to criticize TSSI and uh, in order to keep your point of view about uh, sequential determination. You mentioned current cost, but uh, I think you had better uh, sh you had better mention historical cost. Uh, well, yes. I mean, uh, I uh, two points. One, uh, the the issue of historical cost of of uh, of the inputs, right? Of uh, constant capital in in particular, uh, and and current cost uh, is an issue. Uh, only in the case of technological change, right? Because then, uh, otherwise, if there's no technological change, then uh, uh, current cost is equal to historical cost, right? Uh, so there's no difference. So, so the issue arises, and the issue really is most important around the falling rate of profit, right? I mean, I think that's that's what really uh, 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 motivates the TSSI uh, and maybe motivates you and you know and 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 I don't I don't uh, I mean I think that's obviously a very important question right uh, but uh, for the uh, for the transformation problem right the transformation problem kind of per se right uh, uh, assumes a given technology mm -hmm. right? And so does not, does not uh, uh, the, the question of the effects of uh, uh, technological change in a given period uh, doesn't, doesn't come up, right? Uh, but uh, I think that is what, uh, I mean, just this, this is, is just a thought of mine uh that uh, the reason why the TSSI in particular uh, uh, is so uh, insistent uh, on the on, on short run equilibrium and and uh, the iterative process uh, from period to period uh, is because uh, they are most concerned about uh, the historical cost, right? And, and so historical cost uh, uh, is compatible uh, with uh, the interpretation of uh, the transformation problem as a multi-period iterative process. And my interpretation of uh, 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 current cost uh, is consistent with my interpretation of the transformation problem uh, as uh, prices of production being about long run. Uh, prices of production are long run equilibrium prices. So uh, I agree uh, that uh, this is obviously current cost and historical cost is a very important issue, right? I would say it has more to do with the falling rate of profit than the transformation problem, but there is a connection uh, and, uh, and, and, and that connection is important to both sides, uh, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the problem between current cost and historical cost is very complicated matter. Yeah, let's discuss further. Yes, again. yes, yeah. I look forward. Thank you. That's all, that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, from me, uh, I have one more question. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to know uh, what, what to you means by the concept of uh, uh, short run equilibrium. Okay, I have a very concise answer. Short run equilibrium means uh, uh, prices that change uh, even if there is no change of productivity. 
Uh, and long run, long run uh, of prices that change only if uh, there is a change of productivity. I, I, I think uh, uh, the term of short run equilibrium is uh, uh, is based on uh, mainstream economics. I I, I think. Uh, say say that again. The time of short run or long run? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, short run equilibrium or and uh, long run equilibrium. Uh, this time. Uh, this um, are based on uh, the uh, mainstream economics. Well, not my interpretation. I mean, it's the same words, and maybe I should, uh, you know, I mean, one could say center of gravity, uh, uh, but I think the 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 kind of uh, most precise in order to really differentiate and to differentiate from the mainstream, right, is that. Uh, long run uh, equilibrium prices are prices that change only if there's a change in productivity. Uh, I think uh, I think Marx wrote only a, only a, the equilibrium that uh, arose for the distribution of social total labor. Uh, uh, he he. Uh, he wrote, uh, he never wrote uh, about uh, the long run equilibrium or, or uh, uh, short run equilibrium, e equilibrium, in my opinion. Uh, no, but, he didn't. Uh, no. uh, but nonetheless, right, there is the stipulation repeatedly that his prices of production change only if the productivity of labor changes. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they're more stable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so in, 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 in that sense, the long run uh, might be appropriate, uh, but it also might be confusing uh, uh, because of the same words uh, in the mainstream. Um, my question is uh, why, uh, the uh, short run equilibrium is uh, the type of equilibrium. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, mm, short run equilibrium in a short run equilibrium state, uh, fat, fat, fat equilibrium. Fat, fat thing. Uh, Balance, balances. Uh, I don't understand the show, the concept of uh, a short run equilibrium in your interpretation. Well, I mean, you know, we we will need to take some more time and and, and discuss some more. But I, I I I tried to say the way I understand it. In, in, in the the, uh, the most direct, concise, technical way, right? It doesn't have to do with the time period, right? Uh, except that, you know, the long run in a, in a given industry is the, the period in which productivity rem remains more or less the same, mm. right? So that may be one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, right? Within a given industry. Right, that's to me. That's the long run, right? In in in, in that in in which the productivity remains mm -hmm. relatively stable. Uh, uh, in uh, in your interpretation, uh, the in the um, short run equilibrium, uh, supply and uh, demand uh, coincide. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Okay. Yes. I understand. Yes. 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 So far, and also in the TSSI. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. 
So there are three characteristics, at least, of equilibrium. Uh, supply is equal to demand, uh, equal rate of profit. Uh, and then, you know, in my view, change only if productivity changes, right? So with the third characteristic, then you have what I call a long equilibrium. But I, I, I would say uh, um, the short run equilibrium uh, is, is missing uh, the third characteristic of what I would argue is Marx's concept of equilibrium. Uh, and I would say, I mean, I, I do want to talk about this some more, okay? So uh, I'll, uh, uh, we will, uh, because I think I, I brought this up a few days ago about the one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Uh, between e uh, equilibrium in the distribution of social labor and equilibrium prices. Right. I, in fact, think the long run equilibrium prices is a more appropriate concept for equilibrium in the distribution of social labor. Right. Because with the short run concept, you have a equal distribution of you have a e equilibrium distribution of labor. Right. But you have a whole series of prices of production that change from period to period, even if the uh, equilibrium in, in the distribution of labor is not changing, right? So again, that that uh, I think that's uh, how that relates to my comments earlier or last week. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we'll understand. to be continued. <laughs> let's let's uh, discuss uh, further. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me finally let me let me say. Uh, uh, can can you see this? Okay. Uh, I received this in the mail today, Yuji's uh, book, uh, uh, congratulations again, uh, and uh, I, I look forward to reading it more carefully, and, and I also look forward to your presentation and paper next week and to further discussion of these issues. Thank you for your information. And tomorrow, tomorrow, I get my first vaccine shot. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, very happy about that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, we are uh, just about out of time. So I'd like to uh, bring today's event to our uh, end. On behalf of everyone, I want to thank Professor Mosley, of, uh, Mosley for his kind participation today. And thank you also to everyone who has taken the time to join us here. Uh, thank you. Yes, indeed. See you next week. Thank you. Bye, <laughs> Leto. <laughs> so